First, we got the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Then a new federal government that's promised a new relationship with Indigenous people in Canada. So, what might that new future look like? Ken Coates is Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation at the University of Saskatchewan. He's co-author of From Treaty Peoples to Treaty Nation, a Roadmap for All Canadians. And he joins us now for 10 questions on Indigenous futures. Ken, nice to see you again. Welcome great back. Be, great to be here. Okay, here we go. Question one. You say there is, quote, no sweeping solution to the relations between Canada and its First Nations. Why not? Uh, too many diverse peoples, 636 First Nations across the country, um, 10 provinces, three territories, completely different economies, 80% of our population is urban, uh, the majority of Aboriginal population is rural. There is no one simple thing that will address all of the needs, all of the interests across, across the country as a whole. Question two, if there is no solution, as you've described it, is there a vision we can all aspire to? Actually, the, the Prime Minister said it rather well. I mean, I think you move to a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, very complicated to do, but essentially you start working on what I call the co-production of, uh, co of policy. Um, get Aboriginal people involved directly in, in determining what the government policies are, what the shape of the, the future actually looks like, and realize that it will be regional and local in nature and not sweeping for the country as a whole. Question three. You say the reasons for optimism are there to see. What would you like us to see that is today not adequately appreciated. 30,000 Aboriginal students in universities and colleges across the country, 300 in 1970. If that doesn't make your heart sore, if you don't see the future of Aboriginal people right there on those campuses, in their colleges, basically learning about the future, dedicated to their own communities, dedicated to dealing with Aboriginal issues, if that doesn't make you optimistic, there's nothing that will. This doesn't. Question four, Pekanjikum, Northern Ontario, dubbed by McLean's Magazine as the suicide capital of the world. 90% unemployment rate, a retention rate of 98%, meaning only 2% of its people leave. What share do you think of native communities in this country are in as dire straits as Pekanjikum? Probably be close to 20% overall. It's actually a really high number. Um, not always that bad, and that's a horrible sort of sad situation. Um, these people want to stay in their home communities, they want to have a future, but please recognize as a really small point that unemployment is, is a construct. It's created by government. We can, do, deal, we can get rid of unemployment really quickly by reallocating how we use money. We keep talking about a guaranteed annual income. Give the money to the communities, let them hire their people to do things the community needs to do. You've got 85% unemployment, you've got zero unemployment overnight. You can fix this. This is we insist on describing Aboriginal people in a way that defines the job market and the world of the economic world in southern Ontario or in a big city. That's not right. We can do way better than this. Question five. Former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien said the situation is so desperate in some places they should leave. Do you agree? Yeah, I do, but with a caveat. Um, they should be allowed to leave and supported to leave when they're ready to leave. If you go into this paternalistic thing where we've, and I'm not suggesting the Prime Minister said it that way, so he actually gave a more complex answer. If we go in there and say, you're moving over to here, things will be better, and there won't be, because it's a very complicated process. If we actually set up a system that said to indig Indigenous communities, if your community is in the wrong place, if you want to co-locate with another community or move closer to Timmins, Ontario or something like that, we should encourage that sort of process, but let them be the ones to set the, to set the standard and to set the agenda. Question six. As you pointed out, 1.5 million Indigenous people spread across 600 recognized First Nations governments or bands, including the 60% of uh, Indigenous people who live in cities. You look at that and you see one Commonwealth of Aboriginal peoples. What's the idea? The idea is really simple. We have to do something better than the Department of Indigenous Affairs. Um, I've worked with those folks for 25, 30 years. They're really good people. The idea that they're a bunch of colonial dogs who were sitting there trying to screw up Aboriginal lives is wrong. These people care a lot, but it's the wrong model. And the basic idea behind the Commonwealth is let's not fixate on the details. Let's figure out a way to empower some sort of Indigenous governance system where they can, as a group, look after each other, look after themselves, look after their own communities. A lot of this is community empowerment. The decisions are going to be made as locally as possible. That works. We know that that works, right? So you have to come up with a structure that gets non-Aboriginal people out of the way. We've had a, more than 150 years trying the other way. It doesn't work. Question seven. If the goal is closing the gap in income, in education rates, in life expectancy and so on, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, what effect would that have, do you think, on traditional Aboriginal culture? 
So I lived for two years down in New Zealand where the traditional culture is very, very strong. The language is strong and getting stronger. The cultural traditions are, getting, are, are strong and getting stronger. Um, and so is the educational and, 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 and employment outcomes. They're getting more heavily involved. These things are not mutually exclusive. You can actually have a strong culture. Take a look at Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. Culture and, and economic success and wealth are not in, separate in, entities. They don't have to be. And we've created a situation where, as non-Aboriginal people, we think Aboriginal people have to stay locked in a certain way. Let them choose. We've got lots of communities that are making real headway in economic development. And they're doing a fabulous job for themselves. Question eight, how essential are indigenous languages to the survival of indigenous cultures? So this one makes me cry at night, to be honest, because we are down to a handful of languages that will survive the next 30 years. And we watch these communities that have their languages on death watch. They only have four, five, six, ten speakers. And when one dies, the story is there's only nine. Then the story is there's only eight. That is absolutely horrible to see. You know, you, culture can survive the loss of language. We've seen lots of examples of that. Culture is strengthened by the preservation of language. Look at the Jewish population around the world who've used the, 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 the preservation of Hebrew as a foundation for, for sort of holding themselves together. I would love to see a revitalization program in the languages. We have some of them. Yukon is one of the best at this in the country, but nowhere near enough. But it costs a lot of money. It requires a real commitment. And we do this through grants. Here's two years of funding. See what you can do. You can do nothing in two years. Question nine. A bit of a chippy question, if I may say. Can a culture that wants to stay steeped in indigenous traditions find a common understanding with a mainstream culture that is hurtling head, headlong towards artificial intelligence? That's a really, really interesting question. You managed to combine a thousand things. Aboriginal people are not opposed to technology. The Inuit in the far north were among the fastest and the easiest adapters of new technologies you can ever see anywhere in the world. You know, here, here's a telescope, use this. Here's an outboard motor, use that. Technology itself is not sort of the challenge. And in fact, using the technology to make the traditional lifestyle easier, you know, is, is, a, is a smart thing to do. We've, every society has sort, of, has sort of done that. And I guess I said before, I don't see sort of adapting to the modern world as being antithetical. If you look again at Northwest uh, at Nunavut, they've done some remarkable work at using television to revitalize language, revitalize culture, and to share a sense of common purpose. You know. That requires satellites, that requires video cameras, that requires a whole bunch of things. It works. Question 10. You call Aboriginal people co-founders of Canada. John Ralston Saul, in his book, A Fair Country, says Canadians should think of themselves as a Métis nation. Do you agree? Um, not particularly. I mean, he's got some wonderful ideas in there about how these different pieces have come together. What happens is until we got to about the 1870s, we coexisted with Aboriginal people very well. They were the cornerstone of our economy through the fur trade in particular. They were military allies through conflicts with, with, uh, with the United States in particular. So, you know, we, we got along very, very well. And then we forgot about them. We just put them aside, out of sight and out of mind. And in the time where Canada was created and all of its political complexities and its federalism and its urban structures and everything like that, the Aboriginal people weren't part of that process. And I think it's misleading to everybody to think that, yeah, okay, that was, that was influenced by you know, this strong interaction between Aboriginal folks. The people who lived on the prairies, for the most part, had little impact, little connection to Indigenous people. Same with British Columbia. Same with Ontario. So I, I wish it was true. It's one of those things where you think, back, wouldn't that be nice if we could actually go back? In the United States, they've had this argument that the Iroquois values actually contributed to the establishment of the United States political system. And it sounds like this wonderful idea. When scholars went back and looked at it, they said, oh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't where it came from. So maybe be careful of these sort of creating new myths that create something that we're not. I mean, the reality is the dominant issue for Aboriginal people in Canada is the racism of the do dominant population. That's very simple. You know, that's, that's been here for 150 years. And we like to think it's gone, it's not gone. And until we confront that, instead of pretending we've got it in our blood and we've got it in our soul and we've got it in our national spirit, if we don't realize that we harm indigenous peoples with our attitudes and our assumptions and our language and our, our actions on a daily basis, we're not going to change very much. I think that's a future show. You versus John Ralston Saul right here. we got to try to make that happen. Ken Coates, thanks for these 10 questions. More than welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.